Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. What's up, folks? Such a great episode here with Dr. Rick Strassman, who is one of the first people who led an FDA, DEA approved study on DMT in the 1990s. He is quite noteworthy for his book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. He's pretty much the psychedelic renaissance man when it comes to this type of research. His new book is called DMT, The Soul of Prophecy. Please pick up a copy of that. A link for that will be below. Please also make sure that you subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at the human XP and give us a like on Facebook. As always, thank you guys so much for listening. The human experience is being injected intravenously, activating the DMT in your brain as we speak to my guest, Dr. Rick Strassman. Rick, welcome to HXP. Well, thanks very much, Xavier. I'm glad to be on your show. So, Rick, I would like to credential this conversation. If you could just give us your academic background, I think that would help lay the foundation. Let's see. I went to, uh, um, I went to public schools in Los Angeles. Took my first two years of undergraduate tra- training at Pomona College in Claremont, California. Then my last two undergraduate years at Stanford University. Uh, then I went to medical school at Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University. Um, then returned to California to do my internship and psychiatry residency at UC Davis. After a year in Alaska, I returned to academics and uh, was trained in psychopharmacology research at UC uh, at uh, UC San Diego in La Jolla. And then I went out to UNM, uh, University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, and was on another couple of years of training funding, which supported my melatonin research in the early 80s. I worked at UNM for 11 years, uh, then worked in the clinical sector, uh, primarily community mental health, uh, but some private practice, and uh, I retained my relationship with UNM. I'm currently clinical associate professor of psychiatry uh, at the School of Medicine at UNM. Okay. Well, I appreciate you detailing that. We can get into the fun stuff now. So, uh, Rick, in your book, The Spirit Molecule, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, you you cover your DMT research project in quite some depth from its origins to its conclusions, but it was the first government approved research into the effects of, of DMT. I mean, what did, what did this research mean to you? How did, I mean, how did this make you feel to be granted this, this approval by the government to do do this research? Well, I mean, it was a pretty long and slow process to get all of my permits and my funding in line. It, it was interesting, actually. I received funding from both private sources and, you know, from the federal government even before I got my permits uh, to begin doing the study. So there was a lot of interest in supporting this work, but the infrastructure, getting clinical grade DMT to give to people was really a stumbling block. And that's what took the majority of time. But I kind of began with this area of interest with uh, being curious about uh, the biological bases of spiritual experience. And uh, I had begun thinking about those sorts of things even in my undergraduate years. So this was in the late 60s, early 1970s, and these psychedelic drugs were kind of uh, had escaped the laboratory and were causing all kinds of public health problems. So it was a bit anathema in academics to discuss uh, doing clinical research with the psychedelics. 
It was interesting. Um, I went to some good schools and got good grades and even did some research as an undergraduate. And I applied to 21 medical schools. And uh, everyone that I shared why I wanted to be a doctor, which was to do psychedelic drug studies, uh, you know, 19 of those schools rejected me. And the two schools I got into, uh, you know, one of them, I think, felt sorry for me. And uh, the other one didn't even give me a chance to describe my motivations. So, you know, that was the kind of climate which was prevailing at the time in terms of doing human research with these drugs. So I learned quickly to keep my interests, you know, to myself up until the point that I actually was positioned to be able to work up a real bona fide psychopharmacology study giving DMT. So by that time, um, I had gotten grants. I had performed the melatonin pineal study and and had established my credentials as a clinical researcher. I had worked through the granting process and publication process. Uh, and at a certain point, it just seemed like it was now or never to begin working on the DMT you know, permits and funding. So it was you know, one step at a time. It was pretty frustrating. But uh, as long as people didn't say no, that it meant to me that it was still a possibility. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, the main you know thing was to get the FDA and the DEA to talk to each other, which took quite a while. And once lines of communication opened between them, uh, things moved along pretty quickly after that. So, I mean, I felt a huge you know sense of relief. I felt a huge sense of responsibility. I was uh, kind of poised at a threshold at that point uh, when we began the study. Yeah, I... Uh I'm I'm very interested in talking about what you said about biological basis of spiritual experience, but I mean, your project consisted of dosing around 60 v volunteers with several hundred doses between 1990 and 1995. I mean, what, in your opinion, kinds of, of useful data resulted from this experiment? What implications do you think this had? Well, the study was pretty much a straightforward psychopharmacology dose response study. So I didn't want to get in over, I just wanted to take one step at a time. So the people that were mentoring my study were quite clear that uh, because it was the new, pro the first new project with these drugs in the U.S. in a generation, that it, it was critical to be as, you know, uh, well, to keep the study as uh, you know, simple as possible to not make any outrageous claims. So I, in you know, some ways, established the groundwork for the current science in psychedelic studies in the U.S. And I think I did that by, uh, number one, establishing that you could get permission from uh, the authorities if the study were designed in a stringently scientific manner. Um, I also established that you could do these studies uh, safely. You could recruit volunteers, you could give them the drug, and you could generate reasonable data without people dying be going, or becoming you know, permanently insane or turning into you know, drug abusers or the kinds of concerns that a lot of the hysteria had generated uh, in the late 1960s when these drugs were made illegal. I established also, uh, or I began establishing anyway, uh, a correspondence between human data and animal data. Um, even though human studies had ended in around 1970 or so, studies in lower animals uh, continued apace and were instrumental in establishing the role of serotonin um, in psychopharmacology. Um, so a number of theories had been proposed about the relationship between serotonin and the effects of psychedelic drugs in lower animals, but um, there weren't any confirmatory human data. So, well, as a result of the, the you know, biological orientation of my study, uh, you know, we were able to confirm or refute or extend some of the animal serotonin data. And, you know, we also developed a new means of objectively quantifying the DMT effect. Uh, I interviewed a number of your recreational um, users of DMT to get a, 
general sense of what to expect from my volunteers and uh, and over the space of the performance of the study um, we were able to develop a, a, a fairly finely tuned instrument that was able to uh, quantify various aspects of the DMT experience and um, the, um, that questionnaire has been translated into a number of different languages has been applied to a whole slew of psychoactive drugs, um, including psilocybin, mescaline, marijuana, MDMA, MDE, ibogaine, ketamine. So it's been quite useful in people being able to, to compare numerically or statistically you know, the subjective effects of various psychoactive agents. But also, I was quite interested in the case reports as they were the trip reports of the volunteers because of my underlying interest in comparing the DMT state to non-drug spiritual experience. Yeah. So, I mean, when you, you mentioned earlier the biological base of spiritual experience, I mean, how, how do you quantify such a thing? And what were, what were some of the effects on your participants that, that were noteworthy? Well, I began with this area of inquiry, uh, I think in my college years, pretty much because of being struck by the overlap or the correspondence in descriptions between people using the psychedelics and people describing non-drug spiritual states like those resulting from meditation, near-death experiences. And you know, later, as I worked, or or you know, later on, as I was exploring other non-drug altered states, which might be useful in terms of thinking about the DMT effect, e even the uh, descriptions of the alien abduction uh, encounter. So I was thinking, you know, that to the extent that the two states resemble each other, or the two sets of states resemble each other a psychedelic state and the uh, collection of non-drug spiritual experiences, uh, it you know, seemed as if there must be some underlying biological you know, mechanisms taking place. And, and put, you know, simplistically, for example, if you, there could be a part of the brain which was activated as a result of ingesting a psychedelic drug, and that same part of the brain might be activated through the practice of meditation or as a result of being near death or for whatever reasons as a re trigger or a correlate of the alien abduction experience. In my DMT project, I was especially interested in comparing the DMT state to the state of Buddhist enlightenment because of the spiritual model and uh, system I have been working in both personally with both uh, study and practice was the Zen Buddhist model. Well, and in the state of enlightenment, um, to the extent that it can be described, uh, it's usually described as a state of emptiness. There's no contents, there's no uh, you know, form, there's no thinking, there's no feeling, uh, there's no body, there's no sensations, anything like that. So I was expecting you know, the ultimate uh, response to DMT to be uh, that kind of state. Um, and, you know, the majority of my volunteers also were expecting that kind of state because uh, the majority of, of were practitioners of Eastern religious meditation practices. So it was quite surprising to both me and them when instead of entering into a, a, a unitive mystical state of absorption into the white light uh, of emptiness, instead they returned reporting quite uh, interactive and relational uh, experiences with beings made of light in a world consisting of light, um, all kinds of interactions, questions, answers, physical things being done back and forth, the maintenance of one's you know, sense of self, uh, spoken words, emotional and uh, intellectual exchanges, um, you know, somebody in that state usually was able to, you know, willfully interact, you know, with the with the contents of that world. You, you know, they could decide what to attend to, what, what you know, what to ignore. You know, they can bargain, they could negotiate uh, with the state, as it were. 
So it was quite different than the Enlightenment state, you know, that everybody had been expecting. What was the, what would you say in, in your opinion, was the most remarkable thing that came out of this research? Well, I suppose the most remarkable thing was just consistency of reports and the other strangeness of the reports. I think in the beginning, I was kind of startled by the kinds of descriptions that people were uh, sharing with me. And then I was sort of startled, you know, by their consistency year after year after year. Uh, and it was extremely strange. It was as if uh, there was a parallel level of reality that was existing all of the time around or around us, as it were, um, or um, around them, which could be entered almost instantly. The response to DMT begins within a few heartbeats and peaks within um, like a minute or two. So it isn't as if it's a figment of someone's imagination where they kind of in a way, build up to it. It's just instantly there, almost in the snap of one's fingers. Um, and a consistent quality that the volunteers returned describing was the reality, you know, feeling of this state. It didn't, you know, seem to them as if it were imaginary or hallucinatory, a dream, or even like their previous experiences with the psychedelics. So it was quite real, qu quite, you know, solid, which uh, surprised me um, in, you know, some ways because uh, of being, you know, led to believe both th through my study of other psychedelic drug states where you know, people were quite capable of distinguishing the reality basis of what they were undergoing as compared to everyday reality. Uh, and also it flew in uh, the, you know, face of all of my Buddhist training, which kind of looked at these states as illusory, um, as, you know, non-real, as, you know, kind of hallucinatory way stations on, um, on uh, the way to the formless enlightened state. So I think that the quality of the experience in its content was extremely, you know, different than both my expectations and those of the volunteers. And, you know, the reality basis uh, it seemed as, as great or even greater than everyday reality, which was something I also was not expecting and uh, neither were the volunteers. So, so DMT in the context of transmethylation hypothesis, have, have, have you found that DMT has increased stress levels and like how does this affect psychosis or PTSD and, and how is DMT a, a biological mediator of this relationship? Yeah, um, well, you were speaking of the trans, you know, methylation theory of psychosis that came out um, in the early 19, you know, 60s or so. DMT um, has only been on the you know, psychiatric radar for maybe 60 years or so. Um, it was, you know, it was first discovered in uh, mind-altering plants from the Amazon in the 1940s, but it wasn't determined to be psychoactive in humans un until the 1950s or so. Then about 10 years later, uh, it was actually uh, discovered to be a natural constituent, or it was found in the body fluids of mammals. And then a few years after that, the corresponding discoveries were described in humans as well. So psychiatry at the time, especially during the 1950s and, uh, and the 1960s, uh, was quite concerned with psychosis. State mental hospitals were you know, bursting at the gills. There were weren't any effective treatments for psychosis, especially schizophrenia. So uh, it, it, it also was around that time that the first antipsychotic medication was discovered called Thorazine. Um, and the role of serotonin in uh, you know, psychosis and in mental states was also just being discovered. So when people discovered DMT, in the human body, obviously, you know, they wanted to determine if 
somehow that knowledge could be turned to treat psychosis or to understand psychosis. So uh, one of you know the theories was that uh, schizophrenics, uh, you know, methylated, you know, tryptamine, naturally occurring tryptamine in the human body, uh, to an extent greater than occurred in normal people. So you know, people were looking for things that either indicated um, overactivity of the methylating system, or some kind of, uh, you know, ways of uh, slowing it down in order to help treat psychosis. In in terms of synthesis of DMT in the body, it, uh, you know, begins with taking in dietary tryptophan, you know, from the diet. Um, and uh, then it's, it's, it's converted by just a couple of steps into a compound called tryptamine. And then uh, you know, tryptamine is methylated twice. In other words, you know, methyl groups are added uh, to the compound tryptamine, and then you get you know dimethyl tryptamine. So, with respect to DMT and psychosis, there were a number of of approaches taken. You know, one was to measure levels of you know DMT or metabolites, you know, the breakdown products in schizophrenics versus controls. But that never really panned out because the concentrations are extremely low. And it's still, even nowadays, you, it's still, you can't quite, you know, measure naturally occurring DMT in the body. But you can kind of measure, you know, things, you know, like it or close to it or um, as good as it. Uh, and that's what, uh, you know, people were, you know, measuring in, the 60s and the 70s, there was some indication that uh, schizophrenics perhaps uh, excreted more DMT in their urine when their psychosis uh, increased, and usually you know, that was a result of some kind of stress. And in lower animals anyway, it appears to be the case that brain levels of DMT increase with stress as well. I don't think there's much information out there yet on DMT levels and post-traumatic stress disorder, but people are describing, at least in the field, you know, some benefits of ayahuasca uh, with respect to post-traumatic stress disorders, and uh, people are using psychedelics to you know, treat that condition as well. So just moving on here, I appreciate you answering that in detail. You are the president of Cottonwood Research Foundation, a body that wants to further sci- investigate scientific uh, consciousness. And the, one of the projects the foundation is to develop new technologies that allow for these tiny amounts of DMT to be discovered. I was reading one of these these releases, these articles that you guys put out DMT found in the pineal gland of live rats. How important is that type of discovery to the study of consciousness? Um, well, I think it would depend who you ask. You know, like I, you know, marshaled quite a bit of evidence in support of a DMT locale. I mean, a you know pineal gland location of DMT synthesis in my first book, uh, The Spirit Molecule, which came out the end of 2000. And I was, you know, given a lot of grief because people, um, they interpreted or understood my speculation as a kind of a statement of, you know, fact. But at the time, it, you know, wasn't, you know, known that DMT uh, either, you know, did or didn't um, exist in in the pineal gland. Um, I brought to bear a large amount of you know, circumstantial evidence supporting a you know search for DMT in the pineal, but it was still speculation. But just a couple of years ago, a group in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, discovered uh, you know DMT in uh, the living rodent pineal gland. You know, so I felt you know vindicated, uh, and it also. Uh, you know, uh, you know, lends you know support you know to the role of the pineal gland in naturally occurring spiritual experiences. Uh, you know, the pineal gland um, has been venerated by esoteric you know physiologies, uh, you know, for millennia. You know, Kabbalah. You know, the Hindu. Uh, you know, uh, you know, chakra. You know, system. I'm all speculate about place in the brain or in you know subjective you know consciousness 
which corresponds you know to the location of the pineal gland as you know being activated as a result of spiritual experience or its activation results in spiritual experience of of the highest nature you know so you know the fact that there is dmt in the pineal glands you know supports uh you know those uh you know kinds of esoteric speculations but uh, um, at the same time, uh, you know, most you know people live a normal life without their pineal gland. You know, they it you know may turn out to be the case, you know, that it is you know more difficult for them, you know, to respond to you know transcontinental you know flights because of you know circadian rhythm problems, and you know jet lag, those kinds of things. But by and large. Uh, if you don't have a pineal gland, either from a stroke of your pineal or a, a you know pineal destroying tumor, uh, you live a you know pretty normal life. Um, you know the lungs are the primary source of DMT. You know that's been known since the 1950s, and it appears as if you know the lungs are always you know secreting a certain amount of uh, um, of DMT uh, into the into the bloodstream, and then you know. Uh, you know, from the bloodstream, it's uh, you know transported in into the brain. It you know could be on um, that um, you know pineal DMT is recruited, you know during extraordinary states as opposed to everyday consciousness, which you know may be uh, you know more of what's going on with you know DMT levels from the lung. If we could, if we could just move into your your book here, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. I mean. How much how much criticism do you think that you received from people who were kind of reading your your work and thinking, well, here's this guy writing this book about God and relating it to Judaism when he had just put out a book, you know, on this on this special compound. I mean, how did you get to comparing these prophetic states with with DMT and how much criticism do you think that you received? Well, I actually began again you know, taking, you know, notes, you know, uh, you know, from my new book, even before I completed my, you know, first book. And, uh, you know, I completed my studies with DMT in, you know, 1995. And I, you know, took off a year uh, or two, just stopped, you know, thinking about it, actually, it was just, you know, so much. And, you know, then uh, once I began, you know, writing the book, you know, there were a number of other things, which, you know, led me to, you know, begin, you know, looking for other models, uh, you know, for the DMT effect. And, you know, one of those models or, you know, one of those, you know, places I began to look, you know, was the Hebrew Bible, which was in 1998 or so I began, you know, taking notes, you know, maybe 18, you know, maybe 18, you know, months or so before the DMT book came out. And I was led to the Hebrew Bible, for a couple of reasons, uh, you know, one is that you know my Zen community didn't you know like me you know publicly you know discussing uh, the importance of uh, the you know psychedelic you know drug state uh, you know to you know Buddhist practice or uh, um, at least you know the beginning of Buddhist practice, uh, which you know was the case with you know the you know vast majority of the members um, of the community. You know, so I was uh, over time kind of extruded from that community, which, uh, although it was, uh, you know, rather painful, it still, you know, gave me the opportunity to explore other spiritual systems. You know, so uh, um, I began, well, I, you know, kind of returned to my roots, as it were, and uh, started looking at the Bible, you know, as a, you know, kind of as another sp- spiritual, you know, model, you know, d- you know, both to take the, place of what had been, you know, kind of um, abandoned, you know, through Zen practice. At the academic or the cognitive level, uh, you know, Buddhism didn't quite uh, account for, you know, both the reality, you know, bases of the descriptions of my volunteers um, and the state of the, you know, the, of the, you know, of the, you know, full-blown, you know, DMT effect. You know, so um, I was looking for other models which could explain the reality basis and the interactive relational, uh, you know, qualities of the DMT state. You know, so as I began, you know, reading the Bible in uh, the late, you know, 1990s, uh, I was uh, increasingly struck, you know, by, uh, you know, the descriptions of uh, the figures in the text, uh, 
of an interactive relational spiritual state. And it was uh, you know, felt as real or even more real you know, to the experience um, you know, than everyday reality. You know, so it began you know, to dawn on me this you know, notion of the prophetic experience or the prophetic state of consciousness. And so uh, um, I decided to undertake a you know, very careful comparison of you know, the two states, the prophetic state and the DMT state. And, you know, um, in, you know, common parlance, uh, you know, people think about the word, you know, prophecy as foretelling or forecasting or predicting the future. You know, but that is, you know, mostly an artifact of the trans, of the uh, translation of the Hebrew word for prophet, which is navi, into the Greek word prophetes. Uh, you know, Greek was the first, you know, language you know, that the Hebrew Bible was, uh, you know, translated into. You know, this was maybe, you know, 200 B.C. And uh, the Greeks were, you know, extremely interested in what is called, you know, divination. Uh, in other words, a spiritual experience which allows one to predict the future. You know, so um, any spiritual state, you know, seen by the Greeks um, was considered three-way you know, to predicting, you know, so that is, uh, you know, why, you know, they translated, you know, Navi into, into the Greek word, you know, prophetes, which, you know, means uh, to speak before, you know, or to speak before something happens, you know, but I um, am expanding the definition of you know, prophecy, of, you know, for the purposes of my current, you know, work to include any spiritual experience recounted by any uh, you know figure in the hebrew bible you know so this could be uh, um any visions or any voices it could be experienced you know by you know by a canonical you know prophet like ezekiel or you know by a common you know foot soldier in you know the enemy camp who has a prophetic dream you know so it you know can include any recounting of of you know visions and voices inspiration uh extreme emotional states you know, novel insights, you know, somatic effects like, you know, shaking and, you know, trembling as a result of a divine or spiritual encounter. You know, so if you look at the, you know, definition, you know, from that broader, you know, sense, you know, the entire, you know, book or the entire Hebrew Bible is, you know, bursting with, you know, descriptions of a prophetic experience. So would you would you say I mean you you mentioned this earlier but you would you say that DMT is the biological basis of spiritual experience? Well, I think you know it's conceivable that the you know contents or you know specific elements of the spiritual experience de- you know depending on you know how you define that are you know mediated through elevated levels of DMT. You know that's a theory. It's, it's you know not been proven. But, you know, if you're in the prophetic state and you have, you know, visions and you have, you know, voices which are, uh, you know, similar to the accounts of my DMT volunteers, you know, then you could speculate that perhaps the people who were, exp- who were experiencing a prophetic state in the text were also experiencing, you know, higher than you know, the normal levels of naturally occurring DMT. You know, so that, you know, doesn't mean, you know, that if you use DMT, you're, you know, going to experience a prophetic state. But it, you know, does mean, you know, that, you know, the visions and the voices, you know, might be comparable in the prophetic state and the DMT state. You know, clearly the characters in the Hebrew Bible, uh, their reports of their experiences have been written down. They've been around for 3,000 years. You know, they've exerted a, uh, you know, pervasive and enduring uh, uh, influence on, you know, the civilization of the planet. Um, you know, so the message of the, the you know, prophetic state you know, seems more important probably overall in, you know, terms of impact, you know, than the actual, uh, you know, shapes and forms and uh, the, you know, figures that they see or, or behold. Um, but at the same time, you know, the information which, can, which is contained in the prophetic experience is, 
you know, transmitted, you know, through those visions and, and, you know, through those voices, you know, it, it requires though, um, you know, the, you know, the translation of those, of those, you know, visions uh, into an intelligible message, you know, the interpretation of the visions um, into a, you know, form which can be, you know, shared with the larger community uh, in an intelligible manner. We're approaching the end here, Dr. Strassman. I, I'm just curious to know if there is any single takeaway for yourself. I mean, you said that you had to take a break for a while from this research, but is there anything that you took away from, you know, seeing these people experience this and your own connection to spirituality? What was what was that one thing that you think that you could share with us as far as your personal learning? I think, like, once I stopped my studies in 1995, the most striking, I guess, you know, belief I had once I uh, completed the work was I had no idea, you know, what was going on. <laughs> uh it was way more, you know, than I had, you know, bargained for. I mean, I was expecting I would give this drug, people would have these experiences, and I'd write them down, and it would all be fine. But uh, it was like I discovered or kind of opened Pandora's box, you know, had a tiger by the tail. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, me th that was determining the agenda of these descriptions of these experiences. Uh, I felt like I, I had really, you know, tapped into something, you know, way beyond, you know, so that's, you know, kind of what required just completely, you know, kind of, uh, you know, removing myself, you know, from the field for a couple of years. And then once um, I resumed, you know, thinking about it and, you know, writing about it, my approach, you know, took a, you know, decidedly more spiritual bent, you know, kind of like, you know, what does it mean as opposed to what part of the brain is being activated? I mean, you could understand what, you know, part of the brain is being activated, but you really don't know, you know, why things are so configured. You know, why is it the case that, you know, DMT uh, is capable of transporting people into a completely, you know, different, you know, level um, of reality? And, you know, what does it mean, you know, that the DMT state is, you know, so similar to that of, you know, the prophetic state? So, yeah, I think I found out that approaching it from a purely, you know, scientific, you know, bottom up kind of approach wasn't, you know, really, you know, cutting it. Um, at least for me, um, I needed to kind of uh, put it in a in a more, you know, holistic context. And as a result, I started to, you know, look for spiritual models, which were, you know, more of what you might call a, you know, top down model. Um, you know that the brain is you know so configured for a purpose as opposed to you know as as opposed to you know this is you know just how it is in uh, you know random or even a you know purely evolutionarily a uh, purely evolutionary you know kind of model uh, you know biologically you know socially um, I am more convinced of the existence of DMT and its properties as evidence of a higher order. Uh, of organization, which, you know, led me, you know, to the Bible, to the prophetic state, you know, to, uh, you know, to, and, uh, you know, to concepts of, you know, God within the Jewish, you know, tradition, uh, and so on. Yeah, it really, it really seems like it changed your worldview and your paradigm itself. I mean, Dr. Strassman, I truly appreciate your time, sir. Where can people find your work? You can read about my work, order my books, which I'll inscribe and you know sign uh, on my website. It's rickstrassman.com. That's one long word, and you can order you know books through Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Uh, you're in you know I'm your local bookstore, you know. But uh, if you order you know through my site, I will you know sign and inscribe the books, um, and you can read about what's going on. I've been recording some videos here and there that you can download. So um, it's rickstrassman.com. So check it out. We will make sure that people can access that link below this conversation when we put it out. Uh, Dr. Strassman, again, thank you so much for your time. This is the human experience. We are going to get out of here. We will see you guys next week.